You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Think of a movie scene that depicts psychiatric patients. Take a moment. Got that image in your mind? Your scene probably portrays an unsettling depiction of patients with mental disorders, a freak show. Think one flew over the cuckoo's nest. What draws us to a freak show is fascination. What bizarre abominations of natural human order will we find? We're compelled to check out these fictional accounts so we can feel more normal. Phew, glad that's not me, we think. I can't imagine being like that. Oliver Sacks also felt curious. Here he is talking on his YouTube channel, The Oliver Sacks Foundation. Being social beings, we need to recognize each other, and we do so in all sorts of ways, by the way people move, the way they dress, their voices, where they are. But as a neurologist, he wanted to present a different view of these patients. His book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, would provide case studies of people with fascinating neurological disorders, but in a meaningful way. It would capture the wonder and uniqueness of each person. Patients have long been described by professionals in an abstract manner, a mere accumulation of symptoms and causes. They're described by their age, gender, and perhaps a few significant personal details. These diagnoses have basically one of two outcomes, either a return to health or eventual demise and death. Sachs attempted to create therapy based not only on textbook diagnosis of their neurological disorder, but also on their deepest motivations and unique abilities. It turned out that this wasn't just a human exercise. It became the key through which they could manage their disorder. For example, through expressions of heartfelt singing, drawing, gardening, poetry, and religious devotion, many of Sachs's patients came to life. We'll dive deep into the body of this narrative, yet scientifically-minded work. Part one of the book is about neurological losses or deficits. We'll look at the cases of Dr. P and Jimmy G. Part two concerns neurological excesses or superfunctionality. Cases we'll cover are Witty Ticky Ray, who had Tourette syndrome, and Natasha, a former prostitute whose mind was altered by syphilis. We'll end by discussing the positive impact of the book on neurology and its wider, uplifting theme of the power of humans to maintain a sense of self in the face of neurological disease or trauma. Around the mid 19th century, the French scientist Paul Broca made a discovery that would both ignite and permanently mold the field of neuroscience. For the first time in history, Broca revealed a direct connection between neural anatomy and mental processing. Broca's insight was that damage to a specific part of the brain consistently caused deficits in language production, although comprehension ability remained fully intact. Since Broca's connection between loss of function and anatomy, neuroscience has continued to focus on loss of ability, whether it's loss of speech, loss of memory, or loss of movement. Deficit is neurology's favourite word. Nearly all mental and physical dysfunctions relate to the left hemisphere of the brain. Neurology has come to be a study of the brain's left side, the side known to be connected to the logical, reasonable and mathematical capabilities of the self. But what about the other side of the brain? The focus on the left becomes dubious, since there's no reason why brain damage shouldn't equally occur in the right hemisphere, because that does happen, yet damage isn't often connected, or not as easily, with losses of function. Why is that? Sachs views neurological disorder rooted in right hemisphere damage as being complex, mysterious, and demanding of a new neurology, one that needs to capture the emotions and personal narratives that come from neurological conditions, rather than a simplistic and mechanical focus on loss. 
Sachs found an example of this in the case of the man who mistook his wife for a hat, Dr. P. Here is Sachs from his YouTube channel. There are some people who are not so good at recognizing faces, and in extreme cases, people may not recognize their husband, their wife, their children, their oldest friends, and they are called face blind. Rather than incurring a loss of abstract and categorical reasoning, Dr. P's brain damage permitted him to retain the logic-based part of his character, while also sustaining deficits around the creation of personal meaning. Dr. P entered the clinic stating he's having problems recognizing people. He was a music teacher, and it's mostly his students that he had trouble with. Upon some basic testing of perceptual ability, however, nothing seemed wrong with him. The problem was revealed when someone offered to help him put his shoe back on. Dr. P thought he was already wearing it. He mistook his foot for his shoe. Upon leaving, Dr. P attempted to reach for his hat, but instead grasped his wife's head. Further examination yielded insight into Dr. P's difficulty in recognizing people. The individuals he couldn't identify ranged from famous celebrities to close friends and family. Dr. P could recognize and identify people only by logically deducing who they were by piecing together collections of features or by spotting striking features, like Albert Einstein's hair. The importance of Dr. P's case is this. While he could use logical methods of thinking in a seemingly normal way, he's unable to make a meaningful connection with the things he identified. Dr. P's life was devoid of the emotion and feeling to be found by relating to the world and the objects and people within it. His world was now one of things and categories, a lifeless abstraction, as Sachs put it, similar to a computer that operates according to an algorithm. But Sachs anticipates the reader's question. How is it possible that a man, competent enough to be a teacher, could mistake his wife for a hat? How could he function in everyday life? Dr. P was a musician and music teacher. He'd been able to subsist, to some extent, by using the rhythm created through song. He'd sing out the actions of a routine, like getting ready in the morning, and then he'd be able to enact the routine without being hindered by misidentifying his surroundings. When this was revealed to Sachs, he instructed Dr. P to take this therapeutic singing to another level, to make it his life in an entirely consuming way. Dr. P followed the advice and was able to teach music until the end of his days. Through song and the act of singing, he was able to make a personal connection to the world. What's meaningful about the Dr. P case, in Sachs's mind, is that although the patient could see in a functional sense how objects related to him and to each other, he could not attach real meaning to them. He could not make a judgment as to their worth. In The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, Sachs argues that judgment is neglected in neuropsychology. We don't just categorize and classify, we judge and feel. If we neglect feeling and judgment, ours becomes the meaningless, abstract world of Dr. P. We'll take a break for now. We've gone over how neurology has been limited on loss. Sachs explores how neurology goes deeper through the diagnosis and therapy of Dr. P, who mistook his wife for a hat. We'll continue this theme next time with the tale of Jimmy G, a sailor. Then we'll explore the neurology of excesses. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into one of the late Oliver Sacks' most successful books. It's called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Previously, we've gone over how neurology tends to focus on the loss of certain functions, especially abilities that are left-brain focused. We've explored how neurology and deficit can affect right-brain functions by using Dr. P as an example. Dr. P confused objects and people with each other. 
To improve his functionality, Dr. P sang out his daily functions. His functionality songs led him to live a productive life until the end of his days. We're going to continue the look into right brain neurology with the case of Jimmy G, a sailor. Then we'll explore the neurology of excesses. Jimmy G served in the US Navy as a submarine radio operator from World War II up until 1965. When he saw Sachs, he was 49 years old. When asked his age in the consulting room, Jimmy claimed he was 19. Sachs showed him a mirror, and the man was horrified at his own image, an act that Sachs admits was cruel. Jimmy believed the year to be 1945. The war had just been won, and Truman was president. In reality, it was 1975. Sachs showed him a picture of the Earth taken from the moon. Jimmy was in complete denial of its authenticity, claiming that it'd have to be taken while on the moon. The uniqueness of this amnesia was that it centred on the year 1945, the end of the Second World War. Sachs located Jimmy's brother, who noted that Jimmy left the Navy in 1965, and without the structure it provided, began drinking heavily. Jimmy G experienced retrograde amnesia, with memory stopping in 1945. Sachs diagnosed the condition as Korsakoff's, damage to the mammillary bodies in the brain caused by alcohol. This affects memory with the rest of the brain experiencing no change. The amnesia kicked in between 1965 and 1970, after Jimmy left the Navy. Sachs wrote in his notes that Jimmy was without a past or future, stuck in a constantly changing, meaningless moment. The case of Jimmy G made Sachs wonder, without memories, is it possible to have a self? Sachs spoke to the nuns who looked after Jimmy in his care home. He asked whether they thought he had lost his soul. They told him to watch Jimmy when he was in chapel. There, it was a different Jimmy. He seemed lost in the act of worship and the ritual of mass, somehow more together than before. The level of spiritual meaning was clearly enough to overcome his normal mental chaos. Memory, mental activity, mind alone couldn't hold him, but moral attention and action could hold him completely. The same was true if he was in the garden or looking at art or listening to music. Through creating a careful regimen of this activity, Jimmy was able to maintain a sense of calm. There was still some part of him, a soul or a self, that found a way to exist despite the disease. Loss of memory is of course something experienced by all of us, but other sources of loss are unimaginable unless personally experienced. Take for example another of Sachs's patients, 27-year-old Christina, who suddenly lost her sense of embodiment. Formally, this sense is called proprioception. Different from other capacities like vision and hearing, Proprioception is the unconscious knowledge of the position and movement of our body parts. Without it, we can see and hear, but feel no connection to our body. After being stricken with this loss, Christina finds herself unable to walk or even sit upright. She catches her arms moving in an almost alien manner, without agency. Even the movements required for speech are not executed without error. Over several years, Christina learns how to compensate using other senses. For example, tracking arm and leg movements visually and using auditory feedback to correct speech. However, she describes herself being pithed like an animal during a dissection, meaning having its core removed, unable to feel the world as a result of the loss of connection to her own body. Sachs makes the unfortunate conclusion that Christina will always remain without the portion of self that is supported by this sense of being in a body. This sense is so taken for granted that most of us never even consider it. And yet, it's a sense that's central to our being. Having discussed loss of function, Sachs asks, is it possible to have an excess of it? Here's Sachs speaking with the Tourette Association of America. 
there have been a lot of eminent people, athletes, musicians, actors, etc., with Tourette's syndrome. They're quite open about it. And indeed, Tourette's can sometimes give a swiftness of thought and gesture and a vividness of emotion, which has very positive value. In part two of the book, Excesses, the cases involve not a loss, but a superabundance of certain functions. Flights of fancy, exaggerated perception, irrational exuberance, manias. These hyperstates give the person involved a heightened sense of life that normality doesn't. They may not even want to be normal. For those with functional excesses, how are their lives affected? The question comes to life in the case of Witty Ticky Ray. Ray had Tourette syndrome, a disease first formally written about in the context of neurology by Gilles de Tourette in 1885. Although considered intriguing at the time, its study fell out of favour. As the field of neurology became more mechanistic, the bizarre and rare condition fell into obscurity. However, a significant community of those living with Tourette's formed a community in New York. Sachs commended their efforts, which helped understanding and management of the condition. The root of Tourette's is an excess of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which causes an increase in drive and activity. Those afflicted are characterized by Sachs as being in overdrive. Ray was 24, young and lively. His tics, caused by Tourette's, made him curse, speak and move randomly. Ray was still able to complete school, keep friends and enjoy marriage. He even benefited from them in some ways. He was a jazz drummer, and while playing in his band, his tics would turn into intense, crowd-pleasing solos. His ticky energy was being channeled in a good way. Besides jazz drumming, Ray's tics were known to make him a worthy opponent in table tennis. If they came at the right moment, he smashed the ball with such accurate force it would render his opponent useless. But Ray's tics made him difficult to employ, and this led him to seek help from Sachs. Ray was prescribed a medication called Haldol, known to be an antidote for the excesses of dopaminergic brain activity that put him into overdrive. The Haldol seemed effective in eliminating his tics. At first, Ray hated it. His ability to coordinate his actions was thrown off, even for simple tasks. He found it difficult to use a revolving door, for example, and the few ticks that did manage to squeeze through were somehow extended in time, making situations even more awkward for him. But after some effort, Ray did adapt. He kept his job, and as years passed, he and his wife had a child. Ray realized that his ticks were a central, essential part of him. They weren't a condition, but part of who he was. He spoke about his desire to go back to being witty Ticky Ray, but he knew this wasn't possible, since it would jeopardize his job. Ray used the medication during the week for work, but on the weekends, he'd unleashed the dopamine fueled drive that made him a drumming and table tennis marvel. Ray was able to exploit this overdrive mode. Sachs's treatment allowed Ray to maintain his identity as a sufferer of Tourette's. Let's pause for now in our discussion of the man who mistook his wife for a hat. But let's recap what we've learned from Oliver Sachs. We went over the case of Jimmy G, a sailor who gave himself retroactive amnesia. Then we explored neurology of excesses, starting with Christina and then Witty Ticky Ray. Next, we'll conclude by looking at Natasha Kay, an elderly woman who suddenly became the woman she was 70 years ago. Then, we'll reflect on Sachs and his work. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. Last time, we looked at the cases of Jimmy G, an amnesiac sailor, Christina, who couldn't keep track of where her body parts were, and Witty Ticky Ray, a Tourette syndrome patient, 
whose identity was inseparable from his condition. We'll end today by looking at Natasha Kay, an elderly woman who was suddenly young again. Then we'll reflect on the legacy of Oliver Sacks. Natasha Kay was a 90-year-old woman who noticed some striking changes on her 88th birthday. Natasha suddenly felt young again, as if she drank from some mysterious fountain of youth. Her friends said she became more vibrant and social, even flirty. She was, however, suspicious of this sudden wellness. She believed she might be too well, and it wasn't long before she figured there might be a sickness lurking behind this newfound bliss. When probed by Sachs for some insight, Natasha recalled her days in a brothel, 70 years prior. She had contracted syphilis, but because her symptoms subsided, she believed she was cured of Cupid's disease, as she called it. However, upon examination of her spinal fluid, they confirmed the syphilis was in remiss for nearly a lifetime and now re-emerged. They confirmed the syphilis was in remission for nearly a lifetime and now re-emerged. The illness affected her brain, thus changing her personality. Yet Natasha wasn't seeking a cure. Indeed, relative to her normal, shy self, the syphilis made her feel alive. Yet she didn't want the disease to worsen either. What could she do? Sachs decided to prescribe her a dose of penicillin that would essentially enable the best of both worlds. It killed the spirochetes, the bacteria causing the syphilis. Yet the dose was not enough to reverse these bliss-causing cerebral changes that she was so fond of. It was a medical win-win. Despite these happy endings, Sachs tells us of instances where excesses of function are ultimately tragic. People lose their identity, their relations with others, and are seemingly unable to create any value or meaning within their lives. One case involves a woman only encountered by Sachs while on the streets of New York City. He believed such locations were superior to any clinic, for it's in the streets that one observes raw human behaviour. This woman, not given an alias, drew attention because of her interaction with strangers on a crowded street. She would approach each individual and parody them, silently, exaggerating their mannerisms and idiosyncratic movements. Upon realising they were being imitated, they discovered, to their dismay, she'd only exaggerate her imitations. After going through about 50 or so such encounters, she ducked into an alley and do what appeared to be an explosion of imitation. She reenacted what seemed to be key elements of each parody, all at once, until some imaginary tank was emptied, ready to be filled over again. Sachs came to the view that the woman had an extreme form of Tourette syndrome. He wondered whether her identity survived her condition. What level of self-awareness did she have? Was she simply a series of impulses, surviving from one moment to the next, day in and day out? Or was there a core identity underneath? An idea running through the book is Sachs's aversion to understanding the brain and the mind as a sort of computer. It may seem like we're advanced robots, responding to our environment, via a neurological computer, but forming a self requires something more. Science, he says, takes little account of the soul and the sense of an I. It's something that his patients were striving to get back or retain, or even discover in the face of an invader. Neurological disease. It's only when something goes neurologically wrong that we realize how much we take for granted. We don't appreciate the effort that goes into creating the sense of being an autonomous entity. We underestimate just how strong the will of the self is, asserting itself in the face of the disintegration forces like brain damage or disease. Sachs passed away in 2015, but he's left a legacy of riveting yet human explorations into the mind and self. Here is Sachs again in an interview from 1989. They, they sort of said, tell our story, or it'll never be known. They felt very neglected. I love the feeling that these forgotten people who are so important, you know, can have a sort of afterlife, you know, and they themselves would like that. A painting or a symphony isn't just oil paint 
or musical sounds. It is meaning. In the same way, a human being becomes something greater than the sum of their parts over time. When that person dies, they're mourned not because they were a good body, but because they represented a certain meaning. This is what Sachs writes about. The undefined, meaningful, precious self. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.